And how are we getting on, lads? We all good? We're doing great. Doing pretty well. Good to see you, Gare. Well, good to see you. Uh, so today we're joined by Firzan Dobell. I got that right, didn't I? Yeah, pretty, pretty, pretty nice. How about you introduce yourself? Kirsten Dobell, <laughs> here in Brooklyn, New York, um, where it's a very, very hot day. Hot uh, throughout North America, apparently. I have a sister who lives in, uh, in British Columbia in Western Canada. And uh, it's, it's over, apparently it's over 40 degrees Celsius, which is 104 Fahrenheit. So it's the hottest they've ever seen it there, and uh, very nervous, especially for older people. Um, but here in New York, apparently, it's going up to 100 degrees Fahrenheit today. So, you know, it happens every summer. There's a super hot period, but every year it gets a little hotter. So mm -hmm. yes, climate change does seem to be real. Thank you very much. <laughs> and yeah, and, and, and the show. There we go. And the show. That's it. That's um, the message long. Yeah. I was pretty lucky to go on yesterday to talk about that. Um, so that, that was fun. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, it's it's roasting outside here as well. Like it's just it? well, you know lovely lately here. Yeah, Christ, did, doing a bit a of gardening yesterday. Change. It was good, good old fun. Good. Yeah, we got good weather, so we do. But um, so you you played this character, a very beloved one called Jose Matches, and I, I wanted to have a little chat about that because. As well as really? being like a, a huge part of the Red Dead Redemption Two story, you know, he just kind of hit hit a hit a chord of people. And um, yeah, love, love love to hear how how you got on with that character. Like, okay, so first of all, how did you get the gig? Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, you try out, you audition, and as with most film or TV projects, you have no idea really what the scope is or how long you're going to be called, you know, how often you might be called, how long this project is going to take to, to complete itself. And I, I'm pretty sure, I don't think I'd ever auditioned for a, a video game before, certainly not motion capture. And, uh, and I was quite surprised that my agent even submitted me because I just had no understanding of the concept. But then you go in and you, uh, I, I remember the audition for Rockstar. And the first thing the fellow had me do, he said, walk around the perimeter of the room here. Walk around, you know, in a, in a big uh, square here a few times. And I thought, what the hell is this? This is the most bizarre audition I've ever seen. Because usually, you, you know, you step up and you stand there and you do your, your, your pieces. Uh, so I, he, you know, he wanted to observe how I walked. And I had no idea that this was a Western. I had no idea uh, I think even that it was uh, Red Dead 2 because they're very protective and secretive with their programs and, and not much was revealed. And even then the material that I read at the audition had nothing to do with Red Dead. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was like auditioning for a different kind of show. Anyway, there was something obviously in what I did that, that made them want to see me again. And, uh, and then I got a call saying, okay, you, you got the part and, uh, and you're called for these two days. And I thought, oh, it's, yeah, all right. It's just a little couple of lines. You show up and, and that's it. And then, you know, after two days, okay, we're going to need you again here. We're going to need you again here. And then suddenly four and a half years later, <laughs> we had a video game. That's yeah. It it, it, it's so cool how they put so much time into the game because with a lot of them recently, they kind of get rushed and, you know, there's outrage that comes out after. I'm not sure if you seen the headlines for that game that came out cyberpunk it just came yeah. out too early and then it's kind of un unplayable but red dead it, it, it just yeah. it puts so much time into that thing like it's ridiculous like yeah. this like with the level of detail i've been this one up a fair bit when it comes to like amazing games they they, they had someone like i don't know how would you explain it that that someone in charge of showing that the the horse's balls would drop if it was too warm, and that they would shrivel if it was too cold. Oh yeah, like the level of detail is just yeah. absurd. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. remarkably precise. Uh, sometimes, you know, they would ask us to to help with this. Like, for instance, in for the winter scenes, we're shooting everything in this huge. 
uh, aircraft hangar, you know, that's where we filmed most of it. It's a gigantic space. But for the winter scenes, they would put ankle weights on, on us, you know, so it was heavier. So, so it would cause us to drag our feet a bit as we moved. And then they could use that in the layer of animation that they add later. But most of that, you're right, it's entirely them and their crew doing things like that, like having the horses hang, balls hang in a certain way. Uh, you know, the, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's quite remarkable and everyone comments on the graphics and the quality of the, 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 the picture, you know. Uh, obviously we had nothing to do with that. Um, but we would, whoops. I beg your pardon. That's okay. I'll pause for a second and we're back. Yeah. So, um, tell me where I was. You're just talking tell about the, the, the detail. Yeah. The, the, we would normally film for about three weeks. Uh, and then we'd get three weeks off and they would work on it. Their, their crew would work on the graphics and the other important elements, you know, involved in, in creating the finished product. And then we would come back and shoot some more. And another interesting thing over the course of the shoot, which lasted about five years in total, uh, Roger who played Arthur was, was I think called for at least five years. Um, was we would sometimes uh, reshoot scenes because the, the uh, technical capability had improved over time. So I remember we shot one scene and about three years later we reshot it because they now had the ability to include additional information in the film. <laughs> um, someone pointed out in the first Red Dead, I think for instance, in the first Red Dead, I don't know if you see five fingers all the time on each character because they didn't have the ability to, to, um, you know, to show that, to put the, the uh, little silver balls on our fingers to allow them to move independently so you could see five. Whereas in Red Dead 2, you do see that. So, you know, that was in the course of what, I guess about eight or 10 years, they came up with, uh, new ways of showing this. But it's, it's, a, it's a process that is improving all the time, changing all the time. Yeah, we, we talk about this a fair bit, like if, if you remember Pong back in the day, and sure, that was like a peak, like a peak game when it came out. And then you look now with like virtual reality and you know, like you, you can get pretty deep into that too. <laughs> I know. Like, yeah, it, it's crazy stuff. With, with, with the horse riding scenes, what did they have you guys do? Because I'd imagine they didn't actually put you on a horse. No, they had these um, constructions made that that vaguely resembled a horse, the, the, the body of a horse. And, and they had a saddle on it with um, stirrups and we would, we would, you know, get onto the saddle. We would get up onto the horse and it was standard horse height, whatever that is, how many, however many hands that is. And, uh, and then we would usually grab brains and we'd go, yeah, or <laughs> yeah, whether we were going left or right. And because the player controls the game, we would usually shoot it both ways. So you would get on the horse and they'd say, okay, do yeah to the right. And then we'd cut and then do yeah to the left. So so many scenes were like that, where they'd say, well, we don't know what the player's gonna do. You may, you may turn to your right here, you may turn to your left, you may you know, walk quickly, you may move slowly. So when shooting these scenes, it was, it was quite bizarre to, uh, to have to adapt to those, that sort of direction. Yeah, that's, that's, that's kind of cool. It kind of reminds you of one of those, those kind of things that look like bulls, like the bull machines you get on, they try to knock you off. Oh yeah, yeah. It sounds kind of the same. It was a bit like that, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's it's amazing what they did when it came to letting the player do whatever whatever you wanted. Um, I, I know I noticed some controversy there with how far you could bring it. Uh, Thomas, I think we talked about this before. Uh, there was something in the game where there was this like this woman who was involved in, in the feminist movement and like like the the original back in the day, and you were able to like tie her up and feed her to a gator. 
Oh, it's yeah, true. yeah. <laughs> I don't know about that. It's we talked. We talked about it on the show before. Because <laughs> because it, it was it was like yeah, it was like an outrageous thing when it came out. Is that what they did to feminists in those times? They tied them up and threw them to the gators. Jeez, I wonder. The, Jeez, I wonder. Did. Ouch. Ouch. Did it, yeah, uh, I, I thought that was just crazy. Uh, I think Rockstar even put out a statement on it. Like it, it, was, it was that big. Sure. Yeah, but um. Had to protect themselves. Yeah, there you go. But they, you could just do anything you wanted in that thing. Yeah, it's just just a weird weird game overall. Fair play to them. Yeah. But when it came when it came to your character, Jose Matthews, and doing the voice lines for her, what what was that like? Because you know he's kind of this, he's kind of this older older guy, and he's dealing with a lot of regret, but not looking for redemption. So interesting, yeah. Yeah, I I think what I wrote down for him was regret in old age and being beyond redemption. Like that's because when it, when you hear him talk on the campfire and so on. Kind of how he goes on. So, what do you, what do you think of the character? Well, I think I think that appraisal is very accurate of yours. I think it, you know, it, if your life has been one of uh, excess and and uh, robbing and stealing and plundering, you know, at some point in in life, you have to say to yourself, "Well, I guess I guess I'm I ain't going to heaven." That doesn't seem too likely, you know. Uh, Jose around the campfire reminisces uh, often about his wife. I guess the only, you know, it sounds like the only woman he ever loved uh, deeply and had a had a close relationship with. But there's also the incredible bond between Jose and Dutch, which goes back years and years. You know, our first meeting is discussed, um, and and Arthur too. I mean, there's tremendous friendships involved, and uh, and we all support each other, and that's great. But I think there's, you know, he is the the older character in the in the game. There there's some other fellows of that generation, like Uncle, but Hosea seems to provide a certain amount of wisdom to the younger people uh, with their questions about, you know, why are we doing this and where are we going and what does it all mean? Um, he's not a guru in any way, but he's, he's just someone who's sort of settled into to the life that they lead and, and this is it and just, you know, smile and enjoy it. Um, I, had, I had a lot of fun playing him. My only my only uh, frustration was that, you know, you don't know at the beginning, I didn't know at the beginning, this was gonna be a four and a half year effort. So uh, there was very little information about the character as we began shooting. And I think uh, I, would have, I would have liked to have uh, redone some of those early scenes. You know, when I had a better idea of who Hosea was and, and what I wanted him to, to represent um, also, it's certainly true that, and this is true in television series as well, that as the writers observe you and see how you're playing the character, they start to make adjustments in their writing style too, to accommodate you, you know, to say, all right, all right, so this is who Jose is going to be. That's, that's how Curzon is playing him. All right, so we're going to build him that way. Uh, Whereas at the beginning, I think in some of the early scenes, like at the Braithwaite's and stuff like that, I think my, my, I would say my performance was maybe a bit more uh, awkward or you know irregular. I'm not I'm not trying to diss myself or anything, but you know you start with nothing. You start with pretty much a blank slate, and so you're you're guessing, and then as time goes on, oh I see, I see. Oh, so Dutch is really a close friend. I get it. And Arthur's this, and you know Micah's the bad guy and shit like that. Excuse me, and then you just you know you just develop from there. You, you can curse, by the way. Oh, good. Um, yeah, All right, we're Irish. We do I didn't want to. Uh, I know <laughs> we're Irish. There you go. <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, it's, uh, it's like English to us. But, uh, <laughs> there you go. I don't know. Uh, there's there's a lot to to your character. I, I reckon you did you did a stand up job of it. Like, 
like there, there's hours and hours of you're not talking i think if you take into account all of the scenes that you're in it takes maybe four hours so it, it's a fair bit longer than any movie you ever do yeah. um so not, not too bad yeah you've Good. played the game a few times it sounds like uh, i i've played the game once and then i've, I've seen it to other people's like experiences so yeah you know have, have you played it before I played it just once, the day it came out. The day it came out, I went to uh, to uh, Roger's apartment. Roger plays Arthur, and he he was starting it too. And for about three hours, you know, we played. Uh, I haven't played it since, and that's not because I don't like it. It's just I don't even have you know the the right equipment. I don't have an Xbox or anything like that. Uh, I, I have watched a lot of it on YouTube and uh, enjoyed it that way. That's good. You know, that um, even if you don't have the equipment for it, that there is so much content online on YouTube. Yeah. And, and, and it's, it's skilled players, you know, who, who, who pre present it. So it's nice to see it. It's a lot more fluid than when I try to play it. Hmm. Yeah, same. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's incredible. But yeah, it's kind of weird when we when we talk to the actors and voice actors and they haven't seen their stuff, like they don't know what it ended up looking like. Because you can imagine how short this, this chat would be if you didn't know anything about the character. It's like, yeah, I showed up, I did a job and I went home. Yeah. You're like, okay. Now what? But uh, yeah. yeah, no, it, it's good you got to play it. And um, do you have any, any intention of ever finishing it or are you happy with what you've seen on YouTube? You mean myself playing the game yeah. or, uh, you know, it's always there. I mean, I'll always be looking at it. Um, uh, I don't, I don't have any plans to play it myself in the near future, but I guess I will, or, you know, maybe I'll pass it down to a grandchild or something like that at some point say, here you go, kid, <laughs> you know, enjoy yourself. And they'll go, oh, this is so old. This is old fashioned. Look, this doesn't do anything. That's what he'll say. Look how bad the graphics are. <laughs> I know, I know. This sucks. Yeah. Um, Pretty weird to think, like, where else can graphics go in honestly. 10, 10, 20 years? That, what was that thing you were telling me the other day, Jared? The cinema. You love telling me this in VR. So I have a virtual reality headset. And, oh, um, boy. So I'm able to get it and my computer to work together so it kind of boosts the quality and i'm able to go into online cinemas so like a virtual cinema i could be full of like normal people you can all hear them talk whatever and so i i, I go, go with my friend i'm dressed as like a star wars character he's dressed as like a greek statue and we, we go in we watch monty python and the holy grail yep and uh, yeah it's just it's so weird like that you can do that like I put on this this little this little helmet, and I'm in I'm in a cinema with my buddy watching, you know, a classic movie, and we 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 had someone come on one one day saying like, that he reckons virtual cinemas are gonna kill actual cinemas at some point, because number one they're free, if you do have to pay for them they're about a book, so you can do it from home too, so, yeah, a bit, a bit weird seeing an old Tarantino film in uh in VR. I went to a I went to a cinema yesterday. My wife and I did for the first time, you know, in in a year and a half. And uh, it was a, a documentary called Truman and Tennessee uh, about Truman Capote and Tennessee Williams. You know, two two great American writers of the twentieth century, and and they were contemporaries. You know, they both came from the South and did most of their writing in the forties and fifties and sixties and it's just interesting to hear, to hear their life stories. But of course the cinema was at 10% capacity, I guess. Uh, it was just fun to be there. And I was looking at the big screen and wondering what the future is. You know, you talk about AI and, and people putting on headsets and going to the movies that way. And, you know, it's supposed to be a communal experience though too. And uh, I hope that we won't lose the traditional cinema uh it's just a fun outing you know for people to go to and it's certainly 
certainly a better experience than television, it seems to me, especially in this country, you know, where you, you get nothing but ads on television. Dude, it can get. Uh, I love I watch, the ads over there. I love them. Oh, you do? I watch uh, American football, so I, I know how bad the ads get during that. And God, it, it's like you're watching. Fo- it's like it's in reverse. You're watching, like, you know, 90 minutes of ads with three or four minutes of football in between. It's, it gets crazy sometimes. Uh, aren't aren't your ads better than ours? Like, there's so oh, much more well convincing. Like, you, you actually want to go. Like, I see an Arby's ad, and I've never been to Arby's, and I still want to go. Americans have such a tough time watching uh, watching soccer, you know, watching Euro- European football mm. because it's 45 minute halves, right? And there's no yeah. commercial breaks and they they wonder what the hell's going on. Why should why aren't there commercials? Why aren't we stopping this and giving us all a chance to get another beer or go to the bathroom or something? <laughs> Whereas, you know, Thomas with his, his appreciation for American football and it's a 60 minute game, but it takes cl- almost four hours sometimes to play it. I mean, and all the, t- the timeouts and all this, please, please, it, just get on with it. I watch yeah. the uh, the Super Bowl every year, and yeah. it, it would start around eleven o'clock my time, and it would be over around five six o'clock in the morning because it's even longer because there's more. Let's break that down real quick, you know. Yeah. But there's there's so much to unpack, and I mean, it, it's so unlike European soccer because soccer is very you take the ball to the other guy, and they did that, but. American football, there's always so much going on at the one time. It's, it's much more tactical. It's crazy. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, there's all this preparation for a play that lasts about four seconds, mm. right? And, and 11 people all having a task. And, you know, it's, it's fun to see highlights, I find. But, mm. but I have a hard time sitting there for three and a half hours watching the full game. I just can't take all the ads. That's fair. <laughs> yeah. And we're going back to the cinema, I don't think the cinema is going to disappear. Good. We we got to go to a cinema. What was it? Saturday. Yeah. We we seen Fast Fast and Furious Nine. Oh yeah. Probably the most absurd one I've ever seen. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. It looks it, it looks crazy. If, if oh. I if I said like that, there's I don't know, it just it just this action movie gone mental. It's like they just kept throwing money at it, hoping something would happen, and. Uh, I, I think the running joke in it is, you know, the blowing up the moon for family. <laughs> yeah, these uh, it, it's a weird old movie. But yeah, I, I seriously think that they'll be fine because people will flock back to them. And yeah. in virtual, it's kind of a sad experience taking off the headset because you realize, you know, now you're just in a dark room at 4 a.m. 4 a. Like, you know, after cinema, like, you know, you just had your popcorn, you're nice and full, talking to your, your buddies like, oh, it was a brilliant movie. Or it was a terrible movie. That was Fast Nine, you know. <laughs> well, it's it's uh, you know you put those the headset on and you're you're shutting out the world, right? You're shutting out this world, and you're going into this world, and that's fine. But if if this becomes your new reality, then you're no longer communicating with people. Yeah. And I think that's a problem. I think it's a bit. You know, it's a bit like the concern that, that some people have with, uh, I mean, just with, with phones, you know, uh, here in, in New York City, uh, as I say, it's getting back to normal here and s- the traffic on the subway is, is close to what it was, I would say, pre-pandemic. And everyone, of course, is on a, on a screen, right? One or two people are actually reading a book, but most people are playing a game or doing something on the screen. So subways are very quiet because no one's talking even if you're with a friend you're you're on your screen and they're on their screen and you know i don't know i'm not i'm not trying to sound like an old fogey or anything i just wonder what that where where do we go from there you know will we return at some point to hey how are you how's your day going anything you know like that or or is that over and and where do you think it'll, it'll bring us I got, I, at some point there'll be a reaction. At some point, I think we'll we'll return to honest conversation. But I also think it's going to evolve into something else. You know, I mean, I have a friend who who does have a a fancy iPhone. I uh, I watch. You know, and he's talking into his phone all the time, like like Dick Tracy used to do. You know, and 
you know, the screen, the screen is like an, an inch by an inch. And I, I don't know, it just, I hope I don't end up with one of those. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, it's gotten wild, man. We, we do a lot. We, we study media in college, so we know. I won't do that we know, but we, we, we research a lot of stuff into like where this is going to go and shit. And we talk a lot about like fake news and we talk all this shit, like how long you spend on your phone, how much is good for you. What are the long term effects, short term effects? And it's just so bad for you. There's like, there's like so little like good, good things with social media and they're probably not even worth it. It's, it's terrible and it's yeah. controlling our lives. It's, it all, well, it does. And it, it just redefines reality and, and relationships, you know? Mm. And I mean, it works for some people and, and, other people, I think it, it causes tremendous uh, mental anguish and anxiety, you know, because they, they feel I don't, no one's really connecting with me or I'm not able to connect with anyone because I'm supposed to find all my answers on this little screen here, you know, Google, Google everything or Wikipedia will tell you what to do next, you know, yeah. I don't know. I, I, I mean, it, it serves a purpose and it offers tremendous benefits and advantages, but, but it also it, it also separates us from each other. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's a weird old thing, but one benefit to it is that we get to have this conversation. Well, there you go. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I love doing the podcast because, you know, we get to talk to people like yourself and it is kind of an excuse uh, it, or it is kind of a, a good thing to come out of it. We can have these chats. But yeah, I, I, I hope to God you're right. And that we do get to a point where it's like, eh, maybe we should get rid of the old phone. But I suppose a lot of people, as they get older, they, they get away from it. Like, if you give a 13-year-old a phone, they might look away from it by the time they're 17. By the time they're 20, they might have a, have a good old time away from it. You never know. I hope so. We'll see. Yeah. Yeah, because I, I remember being in, in school and obviously phones around like up oh, huge everyone going in with their iphones and you know during, during the break you'd often see lads who might not have the best social skills and the phones up here and they're just yeah yeah you know like too too scared to go and talk to people so they're kind of like using the phone as i don't know some kind of resource it's, it's a yeah. sad old thing it's it's funny to watch people uh you know go out for dinner or something like that because they're they're having a conversation and everything is fine, but then it's, it's like there's a, a timer, you know, and every 15, 20 minutes, it's phone break time. And, and it's just part of the conversation. You know, there's a lull in the conversation. You can just see one person reaching for their phone. So, of course, the other person reaches for his phone. And, and, and suddenly there's phone time there. There's screen time for, you know, two minutes, four minutes, whatever. And then you return to conversation. It's just part. It's it's incorporated now into our conversation, oh, and that's rough. that's the new reality. And uh, you know, we'll have to see where we go from here. I mean, it, it'll evolve into something else. We'll see. Yeah. Cool. And I, I don't know what that is exactly, but no. but Elon Musk is better. making Neuralink. Maybe, maybe that's yeah. going to be the next thing. Yeah. Wouldn't that be scary? That? Hmm? Didn't didn't Musk like pull out of Neuralink? Did he? Didn't he? Yeah, was was the word out? Pretty sure he uh, stepped down from the project, but I think they're still doing it. Dude, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, like, I, I, now I'm getting that information. I know how fake news spread. I'm getting that information from my friend who said he saw it on Twitter. So, okay, you know, it's like, <laughs> yeah, could, could be right, could be wrong. Uh, I'm not gonna. Yeah, it, but if if you said like 50, 60 years ago. That one day everyone's gonna have a little square device that they use uh, for like fucking. I, I don't know, they use it for maybe. I don't know, how often do we use our phones? All the time. <laughs> they use it every every waking hour they're up, and they'll use it to help them get them up in the morning. You know, you probably sound a bit like a madman. They'd be like, "But what? What are you on about? Come on, come on now! We're we're fighting the Nazis, like." Um, <laughs> But um, you got to put it down. You got to find a way. Yeah, you know, it's you a weird old thing. Re, like, like, I, I, I think bringing your phone to the dinner table, you know, at home, is a mistake. 
right? You're there with your with your family, whether that's, you know, I mean, if you're alone, I suppose, but but if you're sharing the table with anyone else, you know, you're 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 there to look at each other and to and to converse and talk about things, you know, not not to be on your screen the whole time while you eat. The other person does the same, and then dinner's over, you know, and you walk away, and no one's actually said anything to each other. Yeah, that's a rough one. I don't know. God, this is depressing. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it's going to change, you know. It just changes all the time. I mean, you know, we'll see where we go. We'll see where we are. In 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 ten years, we'll be someplace completely different. You know. Yeah. That. Hopefully, a better place anyway. Um. Yeah. So obviously. You've done a couple other gigs than just Red Dead. Uh, so, I mean, some of the notable ones would be Bull and House of Cards. At least those are ones we've watched. <laughs> um, absolutely gigantic Bull fan. And I'm pretty sure I've seen the episode you're in. I'm not 100% sure, but pretty sure. I can't even, I think I play a judge in that one. Is that right? I'm, I've done a lot of these... Uh, you know, in the last five, six years, especially a lot of these, they call it a guest starring role, even though, you know, sometimes it's like three lines, sometimes it's like, you know, 20 lines. Um, sometimes you're a core element of a scene and other times you're just like a little messenger bringing in a snippet of information. Um, yeah. But, but I, I honestly, uh, sometimes I forget, I've done all the Bs, you know, like Bull, and uh, I'm not even going to try to remember them all because I'll embarrass myself. But, uh, you know, that's what a, a good agent does is they, they, they get you seen for these things. Law and Order, of course, Law and Order has shot in New York for 30 years. And I think almost every actor in New York has been on at least one episode of Law and Order. Um, at least everyone we've had on yeah good good we're all working that's nice to hear brilliant um yeah that, that's probably, probably not a battle spot uh, with house of cards you, you were doing this when kevin spacey was still hanging around how, how, how was that experience on house of cards it was great it was a wonderful experience uh i had this very nice scene with um with the character peter uh, played by Corey, um, God, what is this? Corey Stahl? Corey Stahl, who's who's a a key congressman in the first season, and then he 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 dies, um, thanks to Kevin Spacey. Um, and he he was just a great guy. We had this lovely scene. I play. Uh, uh, I'm a New York Times reporter interviewing him. The the one thing I remember is he. That scene was uh, was directed by David Fincher, and and Corey Stahl asked him at one point. He said, "Why do you do so many takes? Why are we doing so many takes of every scene?" And and Fincher said, uh, "Because I I see the actor trying to remember his lines in the first few takes always." He said even Spacey, even Spacey was trying to remember his lines. He denies it but I could see in his eyes that he was thinking of the lines. You know, in, a, in, in television especially, you're, 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 you're rushing through a lot of it. You have to shoot this much footage in a day. And they always schedule more scenes than you're actually gonna get done, but there's always pressure to keep moving, you know? And as the actor, you just have to be prepared and you, you know your lines, but but you're thrown into this in, in this unusual context where the director is saying, okay, you're gonna do this, you're gonna do this and try to use those lines to make this happen. And then you're, you're looking at this person, you know, at Kevin Spacey or whatever, <coughs> and it all has to work. And so it, it's, it's, a, it's an unusual artificial situation. And so you're trying to find your way through it. It's like trying to find your way through a maze to get there. And, and I think Fincher's right that in the actor's eyes, sometimes you can see uh, confusion. You can see some anxiety, you know, as they as you try to make it as as smooth and as fluid as possible. So he's that way. But then 
I, I did another show uh, called The Nick that Steven Soderbergh directed. And he, he never did more than two takes. He, he, he said, no, no, if, it, if, it, if it's not there now, it's never coming. So he just moved it along um, on that project. So, you know, different directors, all really talented, work in different ways. I, I've never really, <clears throat> or until, until recently, I've never seen, like, obviously, an actor trying to remember his lines or her lines in, in a film or whatever. And then I watched the, uh, you know, that new one with Kevin Hart, Fatherhood. I haven't seen it, but I've seen the uh, trailers. Beautiful movie, absolutely stunning. But it, I noticed one point, um, my girlfriend noticed it too. Like, did he forget his line there? And like, it looked like, it looked like it just kept like a weird scene where he like looks off to the top right to remember a line, you know. And uh, yeah, in, in the early part of the film, still still a brilliant film. Just one of those things like I've never noticed that before. You know, if it's if it's bad, they won't use that take. That's what Fincher's trying to move beyond. He's trying to get to the take where where it doesn't look bad, where it only looks good. Um, you know, the other the other way to go is is apparently the way uh, Marlon Brando did The Godfather, right? Which is which is the, the the dialogue was printed on huge cards. And so you'd have you'd have a scene of him talking to his sons, to the family, and and it looked like he's he's looking at people, you know, looking up and down their body, but in fact he's he's just looking at his lines because he couldn't remember them all. Still a brilliant film. Maybe brilliant it's something film, they, should, it, they should do that more then. Jesus. That's yeah. a brilliant idea. Wow. <laughs> or learn your lines. It's also a good idea. Um yeah. You ever, ever have issues with lines? I wouldn't imagine so. I think I think I have. Uh, I find it harder as I'm getting older. Um, I don't know why that is. Uh, it takes you know I have to work harder to learn them. Um, you have to be, you know, you have to be super comfortable with them. So you're not thinking of them. You don't want to be thinking of the lines, and and that is a problem sometimes with TV or film because it's so rushed like that that scene that I did in uh, in House of Cards we we uh, he, it was rewritten the morning of it was a different scene it was supposed to be me in a in a television studio interviewing him and I was supposed to be the dominant voice in the scene essentially lambasting him and and trying to ruin destroy his reputation as a congressman but we changed it and instead it's set in a restaurant and he's he's totally in control in the scene i criticize him but he counters it and so the whole not just the 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 dialogue much of the dialogue was changed but the whole direction of the scene was altered and we had you know four hours to 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 change everything in our concept of it. And of course, to incorporate all the lines to memorize everything. You know, in the end you get there, but it's, it's often a surprise when you show up on set in the morning and they say, okay, that, that scene that you thought you were gonna do, it doesn't work that way anymore. We've changed it, you know? Yeah, yeah. I'd say that, that's rough. Yeah, it must be <laughs> quite a shock when you get there. That happens to you. Yeah, well, you know, it's part of it. It's just, you just go with it. You just go with it and okay, well, I'll then I'll do this. I'll learn it. You know? I mean, what, some, what directors, some directors are very, very uh, concerned that you be you get it verbatim, you know, that you you have every word and every comma as written. And some of them are just, you know, just get there, whatever, whatever you need to get there, you know, these are the important bits. And uh, just fill it in and try to make it sound good. So, varies. Fair enough. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I mean, like you don't have many other options when it comes to the lines. <laughs> it's learn them or get out. That's Espe it. Especially where you are, because there's so much competition for actors. Like, 
you know, somewhere where we are, there's not a lot of work, but there's not a lot of actors either. Um, so you might be all right, but where you are, dude, there's a lot of you. Like you said, nearly everyone's been in Law and Order, so you got to you work hard. A lot, of, uh, a lot of American actors over there 20, 25 years ago. I know I had some friends who went over because because you had a favorable tax situation for artists. Not they anymore. were not paying income taxes, I think, if you know, on, on income up to a certain amount. And I had some American friends who who lived in Ireland for a few years, you know, playing, doing mostly theater and uh, and enjoying themselves very much. Dude, theater Strange. is so difficult. Like, you know, I, th I think the easiest bit of acting you could do is probably voice acting. You know, like just, just voice acting, no mocap. You know, you sit here, you have the lines in front of you, you have an infinite amount of takes as long as you just get it done. Yeah. If you're doing it at home, whatever. Um, in the boot, it's a bit different. But then, dude, you go on the theater, it's like, you memorize this entire script word for word. And as well as the other actors were, were like the, their words as well. Like, that's terrifying. Yeah. But the big, you know, you, 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 it's accommodated in that a film or TV, you may have, you may have, uh, five minutes of rehearsal. So you know your lines, but but then you're you're saying, the director's saying, okay, this is the world you're in. This is where I want you to go. I want you to do this, hit that mark, and then I want you to turn, you know, and and don't do it loud, do it soft. And you're thinking, oh, I thought I thought it should be loud at that point, and I thought I was going to turn this way. So so you have to make all these adjustments, and you're given five minutes to do it. Now the theater, it's true, you have to. It's a Two hour play or longer, even, you know, if it's Shakespeare. But, but you do have normally at least three or four weeks of rehearsal. So you can, you go over it and over it, and your body memorizes it. Your body memorizes it as, as well as your, your mind mm. learns the lines. I remember myself and Thomas, we've seen a lad do Hamlet before. And that looked like one of the most intense things an actor could ever do. It's I saw a so great crazy. Irish production of uh, Hamlet about uh, 15 months ago here in New York at St. Anne's. Uh, it was a woman playing Hamlet, an Irish woman whose name I'm afraid I can't remember. But I, I, I was lucky enough to play Hamlet when I was younger, twice. And uh, it's, it's a thrill, but we had ample rehearsal time. And... Uh, so you find it, you know, you have time to take in this material and make choices and justify them and build your character that way. So you said you played him twice. Uh, can I ask you then, because it's very debated, do you think he was actually crazy towards the end of it? Or do you think he was putting it on? Well, uh, you know, you, he says he's putting it on. Or I perchance hereafter might think me to put an antic disposition on, he says to his friend Horatio. And and this is after the ghost, his father's ghost, tells him, your uncle's a murderer. Revenge my death. And he goes, all right, all right. So here's how I'm going to do it. And I'm going to, I know I'll pretend to be mad. That'll allow me to get away with a bit more. But by the end, uh, I think he, he, he loses touch of reality with reality. And so I'm, I'm playing mad, but I'm also pretty close to being mad too. I think he's, he's pretty close to being out of control. But, you know, every, every actor has a different take on it. And uh, I, I think that was mine at the time. Um, it's just, it's the, it's, I guess, the greatest theatrical role you could play. And so I, I'm so fortunate to have been able to do it twice. It's just huge. It's a huge, it's such a discovery to, to play something like that. As frankly is, is any major Shakespearean part, you know, and not just Shakespeare I and mean, other writers like Chekhov too. I mean, to, to, to suck up the language, the music of these characters in rehearsal for three or four or five weeks is just, it just takes you someplace. It's it just takes you on a marvelous journey, and it's it's uh, 
I feel so so fortunate to have played some of the parts I've played. Yeah. Yeah, they're 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 good old touch. They're good old touch. The old uh, what would you call it? The uh, the IMDb. Well, the classics. Yeah. Not you know what I mean. Um, yeah, but the the Shakespearean stuff is just insane. Like we we we've studied for our exams over here. Yeah. Th- thankfully, because of COVID, we dodged it. <laughs> so uh, yeah, we were first first uh, what was it the f- first uh, student group or student year to not have to do exams in Irish history. Thank God. But um, yeah, we had to get all the Shakespearean stuff ready and would would have been a rough old spot. Would have been rough. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. He he was he was innovative. But it's kind of interesting how so much of his stuff is still rel- relevant. Oh God, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's been no one who 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 has understood and examined the human condition, you know, to to anywhere near the extent that he did. And yeah. I say that, you know, to to you Irishmen, which I think has produced the the greatest writers of theater and 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 poetry, you know, and in, in over the centuries, I mean, I love Irish Irish writers, but Shakespeare, you know, who wasn't Irish, was pretty unique. Yeah, yeah, we, we've had a good, good old few ones. We have a good few over here. Good, uh, yeah. good artsy farts people. <laughs> Even in terms of actors, we got some brilliant actors here too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wish uh, Ireland's biggest export wasn't its people, though. So. What, what can you do? Ah, uh, yeah, that's that's uh, disappointing. Yeah. I mean, so we're probably gonna have to as well, which is a shame. <laughs> we're probably we're, the same. We're we're run by a bunch of gobshites who don't know how to run a country. So, like, we can't really stay here if you know the the cost of a small house is equal to the, to a mansion in Texas. It's like, yeah, what are you gonna do? Like the cheapest houses in Ireland are a quarter mil. Quarter million dollars. Yes. Well, a quarter million euro, which is yeah. three hundred thousand. Yeah. So who who's? Why is that? Why is that? Is it just who's buying it? Are 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 foreigners yeah. buying up the land and the houses? There's um big, sure. big companies, and what they'll do is, or even like landlords will buy it, and instead of you buying it on your house, you'll be renting. But the thing is, like, you'll be renting into your pension days, so like. It's just not, you know, worth it. Yeah, you know, uh, just just compared to the rest of Europe, it's 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 crazy expensive. It's ouch. So Sorry. Bad. Yeah, it's it's a rough old one, but sure look, hopefully it gets fixed one day. Yeah. Um, I know I know the states isn't isn't the best in terms of housing either. You can have some problems there. It it varies from city to city. I mean, New York's very expensive, and the West Coast, San Francisco is very expensive. But you know, most most cities are not. Uh, you you can find affordable places. You know, like any other place. But uh, you just have to be adaptable. Yeah. There, there you go. As all things, such as being an actor too. Um, so out of all of the roles you've done so far, what 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 would have been your favorite? Well, I think, you know, in in retrospect, the. Hosea was was certainly a highlight, has been a highlight, um, and in in theater, I, you know, playing Hamlet. Certainly, I played uh, Robert Oppenheimer, who who helped with the development of the atomic bomb, as you know, for the in the Second World War. Uh, played him in a in a marvelous production, like fifteen years ago. I mean, I'm just thinking of that right now. Um, you know, I'm playing Scrooge in A Christmas Carol. Did that uh, just before the pandemic, a year and a half ago. That was that was great. You know, it's just fun to, just so much fun. And he goes on a journey too, right? Because he's this, as you know, I, I most people know the story. I mean, he's he's sort of angry and bitter and curmudgeonly and unpleasant at the beginning, and by the end, he he sees the light. You know, and so finding a way to do that in in a way that's that's 
that's uh, acceptable and not corny is, uh, is the challenge. It was a fun journey. I really enjoyed it. Yeah. So you're more of a theater guy then? Not lately. I mean, I've done one play in the last seven or eight years. I used to do, you know, yeah, three plays a year, uh, almost every year. But uh, I don't know. I seem to be there. Seems to be more interest in me now for uh, for TV. There you go. Ho yeah. Hopefully, uh, some more in some Rockstar games because I th I think you'd be wasted uh, if you weren't honest because they like the the Jose thing caught on for a reason. Uh, it, it was it's really good. Um, thank you thank you so much like even with a lot of characters they just kind of like cut and dry like Dutch is just you know his voice breaks it's like his highlight sometimes uh, yeah. the guy the guy who voiced him did a very good job but it just kind of a, a normal story of you know guy who was supposed to be the leader being the bad guy in the end you know you see you see it in movies you see it in TV shows all the time so he did his best but it's just you know, it's just a, a trope that happens in some characters. But with yourself, it was like the story could have lived with and without your character, but with the addition of it, it adds like so much depth, and maybe some moments for the player to think, like, okay, this this is what he did. He regrets it. This is literally what I'm doing now. Blah blah blah. So, wow, it's thank an you. Interesting little character. But um, I feel like we've taken up enough of your time. Hopefully you can get back, you to, back to the old garden. Um, so, Curzon, if people want to check you out, where can they find you? Um, I don't know. What are you looking for? I'm not. It's it, it's interesting for someone who who should be, you know, letting the world know what he's up to all the time, the way most actors do. I'm not active on social media. I just chose not to be. I'm not on Facebook or Twitter uh, or Instagram. So, you know, and I don't advertise my email address, which, which I know you have. Um, I'm, so, not, I'm not going to include that one anyway. I guess there's, <laughs> you know, LinkedIn, MySpace. <laughs> I am on LinkedIn. I am on LinkedIn. Um, you know, for, for some other activities that I do. But I'm happy, you know, I'll respond to anyone. I'm not trying to, uh, I'm not trying to hide from people. I just... Uh, I just know if I was on Facebook and, and Instagram, you know, I already don't have enough time in a day usually to do the things I want to do. There's things, it's like, it's like people saying, oh, have you seen this on Netflix? Have you seen that, you know? And you go, oh no, no, I'm about four series behind, you know? I'm still like, like I'm working on, just finished Shit's Creek, which is a wonderful Canadian series. You know, we're halfway through the, the, the crown because we're, we're behind on that, which is rather, amusing <laughs> you know trying to catch up with stuff uh so so eventually you you just get to where you're supposed to be and uh i could make some recommendations i guess for shows i certainly enjoyed babylon berlin that's a remarkable german series and uh and call my agent is a brilliant if you want to know much about actors call my agent is a French series uh, called it's something else in French, obviously, but Call My Agent in English. Brilliant series. Recommend it. That sounds like Thank a good you. one, to be honest. That, that does sound like a good one. But yeah, I, I never really copped onto that. Like, I, I never actually had your social media. I just had your email. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it's kind of it's kind of interesting. You're not honest. You're probably better off, in fairness. But what can you do? I'd probably I'd probably you know, I would get more attention if I was on more social media, like cameos. You've heard of the, these cameos that people yeah. do. I mean, I do those. I'm happy to do them. And I'm sure I would do a lot more if I was on, if I was plugging it on uh, Instagram and et cetera, you know, as it is, people have to reach out to cameo and then they can find me and I'll, I'll do it. So there you go. There you go. So if you want to check out, Curzon, you can find him on Cameo. There you go. Or LinkedIn. Or LinkedIn. LinkedIn. Yeah. If you're a big LinkedIn user. I don't know many, but there you go. <laughs> um, so there you go. If you want to check him out, you know where to find him. If you got this far, fair play to you. Good luck and bye-bye.